I love that song, Our God is Amazing. It is so true. It, what's really amazing to me is the way that you can work in us, just in normal, everyday people. God can do amazing things. And it's exciting. Well, tonight, tonight I'm kind of excited because I'm going to share with you something that's been on my heart for well, literally months now. And I constantly have been thinking about this idea of what the church is supposed to look like. And as we read through the book of Acts, we get a picture of the early church. And tonight we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 2. And at the end of Acts chapter 2, we're going to be looking at starting in verse 41. But we want to take this picture of the early church and we want, to, we want to see how they did things. And when we combine that with the, a study and the knowledge of church history, uh, mainly our church history, uh, we see that the church has changed over the years. In fact, when we really stop and think about what's going on, we see that the church is constantly evolving. It never stays the same. Kind of like with our society, as things change, the church needs to change to stay relevant. And there's things that happen throughout history that, that has brought this change about. Now, this brings me to a question of what the church should really look like in our day, in our time, right now. And when we look at the early church, we see that it's, it was a persecuted church. I mean, they, they have struggles that we can't even imagine. I mean, they were hunted down. They were drugged into prisons. I mean, they were tortured. Everything they had was taken from them. It, and as a result, this, this early church, the first century church, it, it was an underground movement. It, it, was, it was kind of what we would call a grassroots. It started, it started at the very base of things, it, and it just stayed there. And it's amazing to me to see how they just persevered through all this persecution. And then as time goes on, the Emperor Constantine in the third century he declared Christianity to be the official religion of the Roman state. So all of a sudden, you have this persecuted church that has been underground for hundreds of years. And now all of a sudden, it's cool to be a Christian. It becomes mainstream. In fact, it, it would have become more of a social event than it would have been what it was originally designed. I mean, if you think about it, when somebody, when a leader, declares something to be a certain way, everybody joins in. Why? Because he's the emperor. He said, we're Christians now. So everybody decided to be a Christian. That's just the way it was. And the church, it became this growing populace, and it became more of a... Uh, more of a center for social acts, in, in a sense, than anything else, than actual, the actual purpose of worshiping of God. And as that happened, it grew and grew in popularity, then it became a political influence. And that moved into a political entity. And then it moved into a political powerhouse. I mean, when you look at the uh, church through the Middle Ages, they ran things. In fact, they ran things in the ground rules. Uh, we all know that people crave power. And when they have that power, they, they don't want to let go of it. And so what we saw in the church is over the centuries, there was, at the Middle Ages, there was this false teaching. And the corruption just grew and grew and grew. And then we had these terrible atrocities that happened because of this, because of this uh, power struggle within the church. So as the corruption grew, the church was used as a cover for political gain. Political gain, financial gain. It just continued to grow. And more and more terrible things were committed in the name of God. And, and this can 
continued, clear into the 1400s, clear through the Middle Ages. I mean, you have the Crusades and the Spanish Inquisition and just countless other things that have happened that the church was in control. And it was an ugly time for Christianity. It really was when we look back on the history of it. And then something happened around 1400, in the 1400s, that century, the printing press was invented. That, along with King James in England, decided that there was too many different versions of the Bible. Nobody really knew what was going on. He wanted to know what was going on. So he commissioned a Bible to be written. And what they did is they went all around and they gathered up all the information that they could get so they could translate this Bible from Latin and the other languages that they may have found it in into English. And from English, it was translated into German and Dutch and French, and it started to spread. And then the printing press, they started to print these Bibles. And then what happened is the common man, you and I, just like us, we began, we began to read the Bible. And we began to understand for ourselves what was in it. And once we began to understand what was in it, well, then we stopped looking to the corrupt officials of the church and started looking to the Word of God for guidance and instruction. And as a result, the church splintered. We have this one powerhouse church. And when the common man began to understand the Word of God, it just splintered. And what you had was these groups of people that were getting together and searching out the truth in the Word of God. And they started to turn from this institution that was called the church. And in turn, they caused the church to face persecution. In fact, it didn't go underground this time, but it left. As it relates to us, it was the Church of England. And, and these people were rebelling against the church or the state. And as a result, they were forced out of the country. They went to Holland for a while. But eventually, instead of going underground, they went to the New World. And then we got these, what we call the pilgrims. They were Puritans. They were Quakers. And this was another version of the early church. These people actually devoted themselves to living a life of Christ. In fact, in recent history, that is probably the closest to the early church that we've ever gotten. I mean, there were, there were factions throughout time. I mean, there, were, there were groups of monks and that, especially that were translating the Bible and learning it for themselves that that went ahead and they taught the word of God as it were, but it wasn't there wasn't a lot of it until until we have these factions, especially in this country, the Puritans and the Quakers, and they were living this life that was that was they were trying to live a life that consumed that was consumed in Christ. It is, uh, I've been reading about it, and it's just this fascinating lifestyle that they lived. And it's encouraging to see that even in our fairly recent history of mankind, that this version of the early church emerged. These people were the very people who influenced our founding fathers. And as a result, a Christian nation was formed. Here. In fact, our first act of Congress was to pray and to dedicate this land to God. That was the very first thing they did. When they formed the, our Articles of Confederate, or Confederation, our Declaration of Independence and our Constitution, they gathered together on their knees and they prayed. And they asked God to bless this land as they dedicated it to Him. It was just amazing. You see, they believed the Bible was true. And then the church continued to change. And uh, we get into our recent history, and the church kind of became mainstream again. It, not quite the, the central powerhouse that it was, but everybody was going to church. They're, you know, 
it seemed like the church was, once again, a little bit of a social status. In fact, if you, uh, not too long ago, if you were a businessman or something like that, and you owned a business in a town, it was beneficial for you to be a part of a church. You know, and, and back then, you know, Methodist church and Presbyterian churches, they, they, were, they were in the forefront of Christianity. So if you, were, if you were a business owner or someone even remotely prominent in the community, it was good for you to be a member of the church. So the church became mainstream. And we see this pattern that goes throughout history where the church was underground and then it was mainstream and it was underground and it was mainstream. And each time it would change a little bit more. And then we see another splinter, another division in the church. And this division was we came over theological issues. You see, we, we broke into denominations. Some used this the, their interpretation of scripture for personal gain. There are still some batch denominations that aren't necessarily based on the word of God. That it is for personal gain of some sort. And in fact, you know, what makes a good theologian doesn't always make you a Christian. It's, you think about that. You? But our theologies are based on our interpretation and understanding of Scripture. Now, most of our denominational denominations that we have today, most of them, they were started by good, God-fearing men. They meant well, and they loved God. The problem is, we don't all possess God's knowledge and wisdom to, in its entirety. So, so we have these differences, the, the, these intimate int passages and these, these little details in the Bible which are important, but they divide us sometimes. So we see that we get a division in the church over our little disagreements. Now, the church is once again, in my opinion, in a time of change. In fact, I lost my spot on this, but I did. <laughs> yeah, I read it too much. But no, but we are in a time of change, and this is based on different different opinions on the basis of who God is. Some people are going to tell you that God can't, God can't send anyone to hell because God is loving to God. A loving God, a loving God can't be displeased with us. A loving God can't hate what's going on. But let me tell you something, God hates sin. And it doesn't matter what the sin is. So when we try to justify sin, by saying that God can't, God can't do that. He's a loving God. But He is a loving God. He loves us so much that, that He doesn't want us to go down the wrong path. So, the other thing that's starting to change the church is whether or not His word is true. This is huge. I mean, there, there are tons and tons of people who will take stuff out of context, they'll pull what they want out of the Bible, just in order to prove their point. They are banking on the truth of the Word of God. They're just using it. But these are all the things that are dividing the church right now. And we're in, a, we're in this time where, where everything's going to be changed. In fact, as we look at the news and we look at the events that are going on around us today, we can see that it's very possible that the church will once again enter a time of persecution where we, where we are viewed as irrelevant, where people don't see that we have any standing. So when you, uh, when you couple that with those who reject God wholly, entirely, don't want anything to do with it, think it's all just a big made-up story, then we can see that there's this 
being pushed for persecution in the church. And that brings me back to this original question that I had is, what should the church look like in our day? Well, and what traditions are we going to pass down to future generations? These are, these are the questions that I've been wrestling with over the last few months. In fact, in the last couple classes that I had working on my licensing, these are the issues that were raised. What kind of Christianity is being taught? What, what kind of, what are we leading to future generations? And what is the role of the church? It's something that we all need to consider. Well, I believe that the answers can be found in Acts chapter 2. And we're going to look at verses 41 through 47. As we, as we come into Acts chapter 2, we see that the day of Pentecost arrived, right? And there's, there's this huge commotion. There's a rushing mighty wind, and those in the upper room, they start speaking in tongues. And everybody in Jerusalem hears the good works of God in their own native tongue. I mean, these are just simple folks. They're, they're not learned. They're not, they don't know foreign languages. But yet they're speaking of them. And this draws a crowd. Right? So, so then you have Peter. He stands up and starts to explain what's going on. And in, in this rhythm sermon where he explains that the commotion that everybody's hearing and what's going on is actually God pouring his spirit out. Right? And that how, how Jesus is actually the Christ. The very one that they crucified was the very one that they've been looking for for hundreds of years. But, he goes on to tell them it really didn't matter because God raised him from the dead. The crucifixion didn't stick. So, Peter goes on and he goes on to tell them and the Bible tells us that he told, tells them in many words. I mean, it must have been one heck of a sermon. I wish I could have heard it. Because at the end of it, 3,000 people committed their life to Jesus as Lord and Savior. Now, this, this raised a question in my mind. And but before we get there, let's go ahead and read verses 41 and 42 of Acts chapter 2. He says, Then those who rose, those who gladly received this word, were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayer. Now the first question that comes to my mind is, why were they counting? I mean, we're always told that numbers don't matter, right? I mean, so... Why were they even keeping track? Well, I mean, this was an impromptu gathering. It, this was not a prepared sermon. In fact, they didn't. They didn't rent a venue. They didn't pull permits. They didn't print up flyers. They didn't set up a sound system. It just happened. But yet somebody had the presence of mind to start counting people who were converted. And, and it got me to thinking that why? Well, in order to understand this, we need to understand Jesus' view of the church and Jesus' example of the church. Now, in our youth group Bible study, we've been going over the life of Christ. And what we find while, we were, while we're studying this is Jesus did everything different. In fact, Jesus does everything that is completely and totally against our nature. Everything that we think is right, Jesus said no. Ain't gonna happen no more. That's not the way I want. But Jesus left us this, this amazing example. You see, Jesus, when he was with his disciples, he was really with his disciples. You have to understand that this wasn't this wasn't a group of people who lived separate lives, but had like interests and got together every once in a while. It wasn't a club. Jesus did life with his disciples. That's huge. They, Jesus took them to a wedding. 
Martin and his family, I don't know, Jesus was invited. He took everybody with him. They stayed at Peter's house. And we're told that, you know, he, uh, Jesus walked into Peter's house, he his mother in law. And then she cooked him dinner. That's gratitude. <laughs> but they ate together, they traveled together, they probably fished together. They were fishing. They worshipped together. Everything that Jesus did, he did with his disciples. And, and that is an amazing thing, because that, that is not the way that even back then they did things. I mean, life wasn't much different back then than it is now. I mean, our technology is different. We've got some neater things, I think. But I don't know what kind of things they have back then, but I don't think they have cell phones and computers and all this fun stuff. But life wasn't that much different. People lived their own lives. They went to temple. They, it was still this separate individual life that everyone led. And Jesus completely turned that upside down. And he did life with people. Now, this is Jesus' example for his church. To, be, to have this intimate personal time. Because not only with us, with Christ, but he modeled that example for the church. So we are to have this intimate, personal time with one another as well. And he goes on to explain this to us. See, but once we get to understand Jesus' purpose for his church, we can start to understand that they weren't worried about the numbers. They didn't care about the number 3,000. They were worried about the names. Because they wanted to know these people. Now, they couldn't write all, I mean, I'm sure Luke might have a list of names. I don't know, all 3,000 of them, but that would make for a really long chapter. And if you try to try to read through some of the genealogy, it gets really long. We didn't need to know all the names. But they did. Why? Because they were inviting these people to do life with them. They were saying, come, be part of us. And that's the way that they did it. And I don't know exactly how that translates to us today, but I do know this. I know that one of our responsibilities as the church today is to figure out how to do this. Now, the guidelines for doing this are laid out for us. They're in verse 42. It says that, they continued to step actually in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. So that these four things are laid out for us. Now, first I want to talk about the prayer. They prayed together and they prayed often. That is huge. In fact, Matthew 18, 19, one of my absolute It says, again I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Now, they got together and they prayed. And they prayed for the same things. Now, and when you have a whole group of people agreeing on the same exact thing, you're going to get results. That's what Jesus said. That It'll be granted by the Father. Next, we see that there's the breaking of bread. Now, they all ate together. That's me. It tells us that that's what they did. The steadfastly ate together. And they had the Lord's Supper. Now, they would have they would have had our version of communion with a meal. They would have all got together. They would have had some food. Maybe they would have followed the exact uh, modelings of Jesus. Maybe they, maybe someone would have said, "This is Jesus' body." And a little bit later, they would have stood up and said, "Hey, this, this is His blood. Remember Him." But the point is, is they got together as a group to remember what Jesus had done for them, and, and that is. That is something that we need to do. 
do. In fact, you know, we don't have to have communion every time we sit down to eat to remember what Jesus has done for you. But every time you sit down to eat, you ought to take a minute and think, wow, he sacrificed himself for me. And just keep that fresh in your mind. And as we keep that fresh in our minds, it's so much easier to stay focused on it, to remember what he's done. It's a constant reminder. And that's what they used it for. Every meal. Well, at least a lot of them. But every time they got together to eat, they would remember what Jesus had done for them. It tells us that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Now, that means that they devoted themselves to the instruction of the apostles. Where did the apostles get their instruction? Jesus. So they would have, the apostles would have been teaching, and they would have been, they would have been recalling the things that Jesus said, the things that he taught them about faith and prayer. What the kingdom of God is like. You know, they, maybe they retold some parables and then expounded on it and gave them the same teaching that they received from Jesus. In fact, it was so important that somebody wrote it down. In fact, I mean, at least four of them wrote it down. That's more than and John. And they wrote it down for instruction for other people. It made it a whole lot easier for you and me to teach other people because we had it written down. All the letters in the New Testament, that's how we got the New Testament. They were writing letters to each other, to the churches. The apostles were, were filling the people with their knowledge and they'd write it down in this letter and then they'd send it off. The same, and the people in the early church, they got the same exact word for word copy that we have today is the apostles' doctrine or the instruction that was given by the apostles. And the last thing that is mentioned is fellowship. Now this is huge. And when I started digging into what fellowship really is, I mean, when we talk about fellowship, we think, oh yeah, we get together, we tell stories, we catch up. You know, we have, I, I love the fellowship time that we have. Uh, I'd love to get here early so I have time to talk to you guys because I want to know. I want to know what's going on in your lives. I want to know. I want to know how I can pray for you. I want to know where to help. And that's what it's all about. That's what fellowship is. But fellowship back then was a little bit different. The word for fellowship is koinonia in the Greek language. Now, when I looked up koinonia. These are the words that it gave me that is, are associated with fellowship. Or these are the meanings of fellowship. Sharing. Unity. Close association. Partnership. Participation. And contributory help. You see, fellowship in the church is unity. Now, we, we talked about the divisions that happen in our church. Uh, and we divide ourselves over these little differences which maybe not all of us understand fully anyways. But if we stay focused on Christ, we have no differences. We have unity. Because we're all believing in the same thing, in the blood of Jesus. We believe in the fact that He died for us. We believe that He rose again and we believe He's coming back. And that should bring unity to the church. And it doesn't matter who you are or what church you go to. If that's what you believe, then you have unity with every other believer in this world. But yet we continue to divide. You see, and especially in this country, we divide because we live in a society that pushes and celebrates individualism. I mean, it's permeated every aspect of our lives. We are told that just be you. You can do whatever you can do whatever you want to be. You can do whatever you want to do. If it works for 
you, go with it. If you want to believe you can get to heaven in any way possible, believe it. That's what you're told. There's no absolutes, but our, our, our idea of individualism just separates us. There's no unity in individualism. In fact, they're direct opposites. Now, I'm not saying that it's not good to be an individual. I mean, God created each and every one of us uniquely. But we aren't supposed to do it alone. We use our gifts and our talents to help the whole, the whole of the church. This idea of individualism is even gone into our spiritual lives. Let me give you an example. The example of sin. We like to keep our sin between us and God. I really don't want you to know all the things I've done wrong. You don't want me to know all the things you've done wrong. That's just the way it is. You know, it, it's, it goes against our nature. But speaking of the instruction that we received from the apostles, James tells us to confess our sins to one another. Scary, isn't it? Why would he tell us to do that? You know, it's so we can pray. It's so we can help. It's so we can hold each other accountable. I tell you what, it's a whole lot easier to live righteously when all your neighbors around you are saying, hey, or holding up to it. If you're living, if you're living in a manner that you're hiding everything you're doing, you're not being held accountable. Individualism is the opposite of unity. And we have to be so careful with that. Now verse 44, let's jump down there. It tells us that they were together in all things. That's unity. All things in common. Wow. I, I don't know if I can agree with him. We went here about half the things. But they agreed in all things. That, that is amazing to me. There was absolutely no separation. They had the same mind, the same goals, and did everything together. And it wasn't forced or planned. And in fact, when these people gained an understanding of God's love, they just started giving of themselves. They just gave. In fact, they gave sacrificially. And by doing so, they showed others the love of Christ. And as a result, others began to give sacrificially. When they saw a need of another person, they did whatever they could do to meet that need. Look at verse 45. He says, And they sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all, as anyone has a need. Wow. They sold what they had to fill the needs of the people they were doing life with. Why? Because they were doing life together. Not individually. We get another picture of this in Acts 4 and Acts 6. In Acts 4, we get the account of it, right? We get the account where people were just selling everything they had. Laying it at the feet of the disciples and saying, here, you distribute it. You distribute it. They were just freely given it. In Acts chapter 6, we read that there were widows that weren't getting taken care of. Do you know what they did? They formed a group of seven spirit-filled men just to take care of that group of widows. They filled that need. They did whatever they could to fill that need. All through the book of Acts, we see time and time again where people were giving of themselves. They would open their houses. They would, they would give all that they had. It wasn't just in Jerusalem in the early church. I mean, I think it was uh, Paul who was congratulating almost and praising the church of Thessalonica. That's a hard one to say. Just read Thessalonians. First hand second. It's good stuff. But they gave more than they had for people they didn't even know. It was amazing when people 
people understand the love of Christ, they want to show it to other people. They sold their possessions. They took care of the people who knew. And they didn't just do it once or twice a week. They did it all the time. Look at verse 46. They said, so continuing daily with one accord. They were in the temple. They wanted to learn. They were, and they pursued learning. Now, I guess daily in the temple means they went to church every day. Now, I know. I'm thinking we, my boss ain't going to like that. <laughs> I don't know how to make that work. But it doesn't have to be here. They were in the Word of God every day. They didn't have a written account. They had to go to the temple to learn it from the apostles. We have a written account. It's all written down for us. We don't have to go to church every day. But we do need to be in the Word every day. That we need to, and in fact, Paul says, we constantly renew our minds daily. So, it is possible for us to be in the Word every day, to have that instruction every day, just like the early church. In fact, maybe when we have that instruction every day, when we do our devotions, that we do our devotions with our spouse and we share what we've learned with other people. Maybe we have group Bible studies. Whatever it is that we can get together, but we don't have to keep this knowledge to ourselves either. And that goes right back to open, being open and honest with one another. Because when we're open and honest with one another, and we know each other's struggles, I can uplift you with what I've learned, what's uplifted me, what's helped me in the same situation. And we can turn that around and give it to other people. It's amazing. It's amazing how God works through us, in spite of us. It also says that they were breaking bread from house to house. They ate together, and, and they did it with gladness. Wow. They had nothing. They sold everything they had, but yet they did it with gladness. They did it with humility. It says, verse 46, the last part says, breaking bread from house to house, they ate the food with gladness and simplicity of heart. It means they were humble about it. They weren't in peace. That means that the spirit of greed and selfishness didn't exist. They worked really hard at pleasing others, at putting others before themselves. And as a result, verse 47 tells us that they found favor with all people. You know, there's that saying that you can't please all the people some of the time, or some of the people all the time, or whatever. Not with them. They have found favor with all people. That goes beyond, that goes beyond the church. I mean, they took this loving your enemies stuff that Jesus taught, and they put it in practice. And as a result, even the people who worked in their number, that weren't part of their membership, they found favor with them. Do you know what happened when they found favor with them? They wanted to get to know them anymore. They wanted to hang out with them because they liked them. They were good people. It's amazing. So, when they did it all, praise God. So I ask you again, what should our church look like in our day? I, I really hope that you uh, think about this. And, and I don't necessarily have the answer. But I know one thing for sure. That if we follow these four fundamentals of the early church, that we pray together, that we daily seek instruction from the Word of God, that we break bread again. That doesn't necessarily mean that we have to eat every meal together, but it does mean that we ought to encourage one another and remind one another of what Jesus has done for us. 
and we have fellowship. That we strive for unity. And if we do these, we can expect to have the same results as the early church. Look what it says. It says that then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. I tell you what, if you are seeking God and seeking to help other people and seeking unity among all people, and you're looking to find favor among all people, I believe that there will be signs and wonders. And we can begin to see unity among people. And we can watch. As it says in verse 47, that the Lord added to his kingdom daily. So, you know, this is just something that's been on my mind and on my heart for months and months and months. And I keep asking myself the same questions. What does our church need to look like? What, what do we need to pursue? What programs do we need to run? It's not about programs. It's about people. It's about the people here. It's about the people out there. And if we strive for fellowship, if we strive to bring unity, especially among ourselves, among believers, we cross those denominational barriers. We stop separating ourselves along the lines of the petty little things and focus on Jesus and what He did for us and try to and try to duplicate His love. We will have unity.